Hey everyone! As you might suspect, humans' understanding of the world around us has changed drastically over the centuries, um, and this dates back probably as long as humans have been around on the planet. And if you want evidence of that, just ask your parents what a phone looked like in their childhood when they were in high school. Better yet, ask them what a cell phone looked like 10 years ago, and you'll see how fast these things evolve. Um, so what we're going to do today is look at a similar process, but with respect to our picture of the atom. And so hopefully you have this document open. It says Atomic Theory Study Guide. We're basically going to look at 12 different philosophers and scientists and their contributions to our understanding of the atom. Um, and while we do that, you'll ho hopefully see that our picture of the atom has changed quite a bit over time. And so it's interesting to think, you know, in another thousand years, what might our picture of the atom look like at that point? So you stick with this guide. I'll be moving over to another document to step you through it. Just so you know, um, some scientists will have a very defined experiment that you'll be filling in. We'll name them. We'll describe what happened. Others might have a very defined name of a model that they make. Others might have both. Others might have neither. So you need to kind of think about what would go where on this chart as we start filling things in. So the first people we'll talk about were alive long, long ago, and they were more philosophers. They didn't do much um, with actual experimentation, if you will, but they did more kind of thought experiments and thinking and looking at the world around them and trying to figure out how, why it behaved the way it did. Um, and so one thing that you can do that's similar to what these early philosophers did, and it's a great way to entertain your younger siblings for hours upon hours, is to ask your younger sibling to stand in the middle of a room and walk halfway to one of the walls. And once they've done that, ask them to walk another half of the remaining distance. And once they've done that, another half of the remaining distance. And you and they will quickly realize that they are going to run out of room and they won't really be able to move. But if they're always only moving halfway, then they'll never really reach the wall either. Um, so you can get them thinking about that. You can hopefully get them just standing for hours staring at a wall and not able to move anywhere. Um, it should be great times. So philosophers back in the day thought about this same thing. They were thinking, well, if we cut something in half and then cut it in half again and then cut it in half again, in theory, we should always be able to cut something in half. But isn't there a point at which it's so small that we can't cut it in half? And so that's kind of a tough thing to reconcile in your mind. What's going on there? So let's talk about two of these early philosophers. The first one that we'll look at is Democritus. <clears throat> so Democritus was around in the late 400s, and this is BC, so this is about you know 2,400 years ago. And he said that all matter is composed of tiny indivisible particles, and he called them atomos. And if you look at atomos, hidden in there is the word atom, so you can kind of see where our word atom comes from. He didn't have a specific model that he named, but he was probably thinking about atoms as something that looked like this. So basically tiny little particles that you can't cut anymore, and those must be the basic building blocks of everything we see around us. Then we have our friend Aristotle. Aristotle expanded a little bit. He said, well, you know, maybe we have those tiny invisible particles, but they all have a very fundamental basis, and there are four of them. And so those four are earth, air, fire, and water. And this might look a little crazy now based on our current understanding of the periodic table, but back in the mid-300s BC when Aristotle was around, you have to think about this is what the world around you looked like, right? You have things that are made out of solids, you have the gas that you're breathing around, you have liquid water obviously in the oceans, and then fire was a big deal for people to be able to survive. So this isn't all that crazy <clears throat> whenever you think about it in terms of being around 2,300 years ago. We're going to jump forward in time now. Now we're going to be close to the time of the American Revolution, right? So a couple hundred years ago, we have this big gap where we're not doing much in terms of our understanding of the atom. And now we're going to start talking about some of the early chemists. So the early chemists are people who actually have some experiments going on, trying specifically to unravel some of the mysteries dealing with this picture of the atom. And we're going to look at three of these early chemists. So the first one we're going to look at is Antoine Lavoisier. Lavoisier is a French gentleman. He is around in the late 1700s, and he has two rather large contributions to our understanding of matter. Um, so first off, he proposes the law of conservation of mass, also known as the law of conservation of matter, which basically says that you can't create or destroy mass in a chemical reaction. In other words, on the left side of this chemical equation, here are the reactants. The mass of those reactants must equal 
the mass of the products over here on the right. Now we've rearranged them. You'll notice that we had carbon sitting with hydrogen over here, and on the right-hand side, carbon is now sitting with oxygen. So it's okay that we rearrange them, but overall, on both sides of the equation, we need to have the same numbers of each type of atom because that gives us the same mass. If every atom has <coughs> a given mass and we have the same numbers, then we're going to have the mass uniform throughout. Another law that's a little bit more confusing that Lavoisier talks about is the law of constant composition. And this one is a little bit confusing in today's terms because we know that water, for instance, is H2O. And we have that fundamental understanding. But you have to remember that Lavoisier didn't. And so the law of constant composition is cool that he kind of experimented and thought about. He realized through experimentation that if you look at water, water always has the same ratio. And it's 11.21 to 88.70 and that's the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen by mass, and that never changes. So what he's saying is that in certain compounds, the ratio of one atom to another never changes because the mass never changes. And so this is kind of the, the groundwork for leading us now to understand that, that things like water, these, these compounds, have a specific chemical formula. But remember, these formulas didn't exist when Lavoisier was, was talking about them. Next is John Dalton. So John Dalton is going to be our first scientist who actually proposes a model of the atom. Dalton also did certainly experimentations of his own. He did a lot with volatile gases, but he also kind of took some ideas from people who had come before him, and he put them together and made his own atomic theory. And so this is kind of the first well-rounded atomic theory, and it has five parts. So I'll let you read those five parts. You'll notice that some of them we've already discussed, and some of them came from people before him. So this idea that elements are made of small particles called atomos, we talked about that back in the philosophy days. We said that they can't be created or destroyed. We talked about that just recently with some other scientists. They combine in simple whole number ratios. We just talked about that on the last slide. <clears throat> um, and then in reactions, we combine, separate, or rearrange, but we don't destroy the mass or matter, right? So this is similar to what Lavoisier was saying just a little bit ago. So from all of those, John Dalton proposes the billiard ball model. And the billiard ball model looks like this. For those who haven't played billiards, a billiard ball is a pool ball. So John, John Dalton is thinking of atoms as these small, indivisible, little particles that are just these round things that you can't cut anymore. Now, obviously, they're not the size of pool balls, but he's imagining these tiny, tiny things that have the same characteristics, right? Indivisible, hard to cut, and they are basically the, the building blocks of matter as we know it. And then we have Michael Faraday. So Michael Faraday is given credit with establishing the link between atoms, electricity, and magnetism. Um, and so we now know that something like water, you can see it there on the left, is polar, meaning that these hydrogens are partially positive, while the oxygen up here is partially negative. Why is that? Because there's a big difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen, and that's something we'll get to a little later on down the road. But that kind of difference in charge creates the opportunity for different atoms to be able to conduct electricity, different compounds to conduct electricity, and also the ability for different atoms to be magnetic. Um, so Faraday is given credit with kind of doing research there and establishing that link. Let's now talk about some of our experimenters. So the experimenters are more around in the Industrial Revolution, and they have specific experiments associated with their name. They also sometimes have specific uh, models of the atom associated with their name. And just for time context, during the Industrial Revolution, this is a picture on the left and the right of our lovely city, Pittsburgh. And that was taken around noontime, and you can see what color the sky is. So that's a little bit crazy to think about the pollution um, that was around in Pittsburgh, and we've you know clearly come a long way from there. So let's first talk about J.J. Thompson. So J.J. Thompson, he did some experiments with the cathode ray tube. So his experiment is the cathode ray tube experiment, and here's what it looks like. So J.J. Thompson had this beam, and it came out of a cathode, and he noticed something. If he had the beam just normally, it would go from the cathode to the anode in a straight line, no big deal, great beam of particles. Um, and this wasn't all that groundbreaking for his day in the late 1800s. But here's what he did. He then took a positively charged plate and he put it on one side of the cathode ray tube and a negatively charged plate and put it on the other side of the cathode ray tube. And here's what he noticed. If he again let the cathode ray tube fire, he noticed that it did this. 
and you'll notice that it bends, and it bends right where the charged particles are. And so that led him to kind of realize something. He realized that if this is bending towards the positive plate, that must mean that this cathode ray that's firing this direction is negatively charged. Now, how do we know that? Well, two reasons. It is deflected away from the negative plate, and remember, like charges repel, and it's deflected towards the positive plate, and opposite charges attract. So the fact that it's attracted to positive and repelled from negative must mean that this cathode ray is negative itself. And so the fact that it's negative leads J.J. Thompson to believe that somewhere in this atom there must be negatively charged particles. And so he comes up with something called the plum pudding model. Now, J.J. Thompson is from Great Britain. Plum pudding is not a very common dessert in the U.S., but this on the left-hand side is plum pudding. Evidently, it's a delectable treat in the U.K. Um, and so you'll notice that it's kind of this cake with little bits of plum throughout. And this is J.J. Thompson's model of the atom. Probably a better model for our understanding would be the chocolate chip cookie model, right? Because this is a big area of positive charge, and then the chocolate chips are little negatively charged particles. So the plum pudding model if we're getting away from food, looks like this in the middle. And it says that we have this big area of positive charge, kind of like Dalton's billiard ball. That's all positively charged everywhere you see in dark blue. But then scattered throughout are these little negatively charged particles, right? And so those are the, like the chocolate chips. And he knows that there have to be little negatively charged particles because of his cathode ray tube experiment where he's recognizing that there's something in these atoms that are made up of negatively charged particles. So it's called the plum pudding model. It looks like a chocolate chip cookie. We need to know that the cookie part or the dark blue part here is positively charged and then scattered throughout the positively charged are the negative little bits of chocolate chip or plum or what have you. So next up is Milliken. Milliken's going to take Thompson's work. Thompson is kind of given credit for discovering the electron and he's going to do a little bit more with that, that electron that, that uh, Thompson has discovered. And so Milliken has an experiment called the oil drop experiment. And we'll see some videos on this a little bit later on, but in his oil drop experiment, what Milliken does is he has a little perfume bottle full of oil. And this perfume bottle shoots a very, very small spray, or, or a spray of very, very fine droplets of, of oil into this chamber on the top. And after you have these really fine bits of oil, he is going to pass that oil through a plate and that plate is going to give them an electric charge. So he's gonna put a little charge on the oil drops. And then once the positive plate is turned on here, and there's a negative plate turned on here, what Milliken is able to do is he's able to make these drops that are dropping through, they're able to levitate in the middle, like so. And the way he's able to make them levitate is because they have a charge on them, right? So if they're negatively charged, we saw that Thompson found the negatively charged electron. If he turns on this negative plate on the bottom, the negative charge down here is going to repel the negative charge and keep it forced up. And at the exact same time, the positive plate is going to pull that negative charge up, right? So for two reasons, they, Milliken is able to make this drop kind of stay levitated in between the two plates. And you may ask yourself, well, wait, if all of, the, all of the forces are pulling up here, we're pushing up with a negative charge, we're pulling up with a positive charge, why does this drop fall? Well, it falls due to gravity. And if it's falling due to gravity, we know the mass of the oil drops up here. And we'll learn in physics that mass and gravity are, are very specifically related, right? And so when you have the mass of these oil droplets and you know the charge that you put on them, that allowed Millikan to determine something called the mass-to-charge ratio or charge to mass ratio of an electron. We'll watch this video in a minute, so you don't need to do that. Um, but he figured out, Millikan figured out, that the charge of a single electron is this number. So 1.592 times 10 to the minus 19th in a unit called Coulomb. The important part is that Millikan has now given us basically the mass of an electron, but also importantly, for every unit of mass of an electron, what is its charge? Our last experimenter is Ernest Rutherford. So Rutherford has an experiment called the gold foil experiment. And Rutherford's experiment allows him to figure out that these atoms have a really, really heavy relative to their size, but really, really small central area that he's going to call the nucleus. But let's get there in a second. So here's what Rutherford did. 
Rutherford had a piece of gold foil. You can see it sitting here, and it's surrounded by this detector screen that's kind of circular here, this blue thing. And what Rutherford does is he takes <clears throat> this box here, and he's going to shoot little radioactive particles called alpha particles out of the box. So he's just going to emit alpha particles. And almost all the time, those alpha particles pass straight through the gold foil. So you can see this dark red line coming through. Most of them come right through. They hit the detector back here. No surprise. All's well. But shockingly, every once in a while, very rarely, but every once in a while, some of those alpha particles are deflected. Some of them are deflected a little bit off to the side, like so. Some of them are deflected a little bit off to this side. And every once in a while, they actually bounce almost straight back. So Rutherford is saying, what the heck is going on here? He actually has a famous quote where he says, this is as if you took a cannon and you shot a cannon at a piece of tissue paper and the cannonball bounced back at you, right? And that would be shocking. That would be no good for the cannon operator, certainly. Um, but the people doing this experiment are shocked. They're saying, why are these cannonballs, these alpha particles, why are they bouncing off this piece of gold foil that's really, really thin? And so here's what Rutherford realized. He realized that most of the alpha particles, we'll look at this picture right here on the left, or on the right, excuse me, most of the alpha particles are going straight through the gold foil, like so, they're not hitting anything. But every once in a while, they are bouncing back. So what are they bouncing off of? And in order to understand that, we need to first realize that alpha particles, and Rutherford knew this, are positively charged. So they're positively charged. So what could make them bounce back? Well, the only thing that can make them bounce back is if something in this gold foil was positively charged, right? Because it has to repel this positive charge. And it has to be relatively big, right? So even though we're dealing with an atom and things are really, really tiny, relative to the, to the size of the atom, these alpha particles need to be relatively heavy. And I, I said big earlier. I mean heavy, not big, right? So they need to be relatively heavy to repel this alpha particle, but they actually need to be really small because most alpha particles pass right between them, right? They never hit anything. And so the fact that they never hit anything means that these things are really, really small, but really, really heavy and also positively charged. So Rutherford, from that, is given credit of discovering the nucleus, this really small, but really heavy, positively charged piece in the middle of an atom. And he makes this model of the atom, which we call the planetary model. So this is kind of like the Jimmy Neutron style model of the atom, where we have a small positively charged nucleus, that's the black part in here, and then there are these electrons, these negatively charged bits, kind of in orbits around them, like the planets, that's why it's called the planetary model. So the black part here is like our sun, and the red little electrons are like our planets. Rutherford's model is getting pretty darn close to our present day understanding of the model, but it's not quite there for a pretty specific reason, which is that our current understanding of the model does not have these fixed orbits, but we'll get there in a second. So now let's talk a little bit more about that current understanding. We're going to chat about some folks who came around in the early to mid-1900s who really enhanced our understanding of the model, and then what our current picture looks like. So first off, let's talk about Becquerel. Becquerel was again around in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he did a lot of research with radioactivity. So we'll talk all about radioactivity. We'll discuss these three types, alpha decay, beta decay, and gamma decay. And when we're thinking about these, um, we want to know that radioactivity is basically atoms that spontaneously emit particles. We call that a radioactive atom. Um, and so Becquerel did a lot of research with these radioactive atoms, but we'll get more in-depth with these a little bit later on. Similarly is someone named Marie Curie, now Madame Curie. So Marie Curie also worked a lot with radioactivity. She expanded on the work of Becquerel that we just talked about. She dealt extensively with radium, so that was the atom she was looking at quite a bit. Unfortunately, she died a little bit early. She died young at 66, um, and this is likely due to a lot of long-term radiation exposure. But again, we'll talk more about her. We'll talk more about Becquerel as we talk about radioactive atoms. Niels Bohr is another person we will discuss. He doesn't have a specific model other than an expansion on Bohr's planetary model, and I suppose if we had to give him a model, it would be this one on the left. We would call it the Bohr model. So the Bohr model of the atom looks like this, but you have to kind of imagine it in three dimensions, similar to Rutherford's planetary model. And the reason there's a picture of a ladder is that you can think of these rings, 
also known as orbits, you can think of those rings as rungs of a ladder. And what Bohr realized, through some experimentation that we'll actually see when we look at some emission spectra, what Bohr realized is that the atoms that we're dealing with had little electrons that were fixed to specific units of energy. So basically, electrons could be on this ring, they could be on this ring, they could be on this ring, but they weren't allowed to be anywhere in between. And this will make a lot more sense when we actually do an experiment and we look at some different emission of different gases and the different colors they give off, because it turns out that the wavelength of energy associated with moving an electron from one place to another has a certain color that's associated with it. So basically, as you have an electron jump from one of these orbits to another orbit, just like you see in this blue arrow, that gives off a certain color. And because different atoms have different colors associated with exciting their atoms, that led Bohr to realize that probably electrons are jumping from one rung to another of the ladder. They're not anywhere in between. And our final scientist, our final person that we're discussed, is Erwin Schrödinger. So Schrödinger is given credit with the quantum mechanical model. The quantum mechanical model is our current understanding of what the atom looks like. It has a picture that looks like this. We're going to expand quite a bit more on it throughout this unit, so we won't go in-depth here. But he basically takes the planetary model and does one big change to it. He says that electrons are not in those fixed orbits like we saw in Rutherford's planetary model. They're not like the orbits of the planets. Instead, electrons exist in these areas that we call orbitals. So this red thing is an orbital. This orange thing is an orbital. Electrons exist in those regions called orbitals, which are regions of probability around the nucleus where we expect to find electrons. And again, we'll do much more work with this, but basically what Schrodinger is saying is he's saying through his experimentation, if you have a certain electron, it is 99.99% likely to be in this region of space. I'm not going to tell you where in that region of space it is, but it's going to be somewhere in that region of space. And he also did some work and kind of processed the math behind two different experiments. Uh, one is called the dual slit experiment. And the dual slit experiment allowed us to figure out something called the wave-particle duality. So wave-particle duality means that electrons exist as both a wave and a particle. And they do that at the exact same time. So they're both a wave and a particle at the same time. And that's really, really odd. And so Schrodinger has a really famous thought experiment that he talks about called Schrodinger's cat. And Schrodinger's cat goes like this. You may have heard about this kind of thought experiment and, and what it means. Schrodinger's cat was a hypothetical cat. He didn't really do this to a cat. But imagine if you put a cat in a box. And you put the cat in the box with a little vial of poison, unfortunately. And you have this little timer up here. And the timer is connected to a hammer that's going to break the bottle of poison. And imagine if you allow the, the experiment to commence. And you have this timer here set that 50% of the time, or 50% of the trials, it's going to drop the hammer and shatter the poison. And the other 50% of the time, it's not going to shatter the poison. Right? So you don't know, once you seal the box whether the poison has been released. You don't know whether the cat is alive or dead, for instance. So what Schrodinger's cat experiment kind of deals with is he says, once you release this box, once you start it going, and you have this you know, timer thing that's either going to kill the cat or not kill the cat, then he's saying the cat is both alive and dead until you open the box to look at it. So it's both states at once. It's both a wave and a particle until you look at it. And so Schrodinger's cat represents that in kind of a weird way. He's saying, look, there's no way for you to prove that it's not alive and dead at the same time. Because as soon as you look at it to figure out whether it's alive or dead, that is the act that makes it become alive or dead. And so the really strange thing about the dual slit experiment and the wave-particle duality is that the sheer act of observing this experiment actually changes what the experiment does. It makes the electron either become a wave or a particle. So we're going to talk more about